So we've sped along quickly today, right? Matthew's gospel doesn't spend a lot of time in Jesus growing up years. In fact, nothing. We, last week, Matthew 2, Jesus is, is going to be presented to the uh, temple after he's been born. The, the Magi come. We celebrated that last week. They arrive, they, they worship, and then they leave, and he's presented to the temple, and then Joseph gets the word to get out of here, uh, head on down to uh, Egypt, because Herod is after your son. So there he goes, he's whisked down there, and then he, uh, Joseph gets the word to bring him back, but don't take him back to Jerusalem, because Herod's son will now be after him, so they go up to Nazareth. And then the next thing, chapter 3, we turn the page and Jesus is getting baptized. He goes from infant Jesus or yet child Jesus to grown man Jesus in a matter of a chapter. And Matthew doesn't linger there, doesn't spend any time there with his growing up years. It's only in Luke that we get the idea that Jesus was tough as a 12-year-old. That's when he uh, snuck away and went back to his father's house to do the teaching. But in, in Matthew, it's just child Jesus, and then today we're at baptism. It, 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 it skips all those years when we want to know what was Jesus really like when he was a teenager. How do you deal with a teenager, even one like Jesus? So we get, get right over here to the man. The man, Jesus, showing up to John the baptizer. And he comes to John and he, he asks to be baptized. And John rightfully says, you know, you shouldn't be baptized by me. I should be baptized by you. And, and you need to know that when someone baptizes someone, there's kind of this disciple mentality. So for the person who does the baptizing, he then is the mentor or, or the leader of the one who is baptized, and the one who's baptized is his disciple. Disciple, you know, we put it at kind of a, a high level, it, it means student. Um, so John the Baptist would then be the teacher of Jesus the student. He says, wait, this is not the right order. I've been proclaiming that you're going to come, and you're going to be the one who brings Holy Spirit and, and fire, and you're baptism, all I have is water. You're going to be the one who comes. And of course, water, water is, is a sign of, of cleansing. And John knows that if I don't need to cleanse you. If anything, you need to cleanse me. You don't the one who needs repentance. Anybody can see you're the one. You're the one who's coming, who baptizes in a way that I could never baptize. But Jesus says, let's do it this way. We're going to fulfill all righteousness. We're going to do it the way it's been foretold. So John relents and, and, and baptizes Jesus and all of that place. We think about uh, repentance, about why we need it, and what good it's for. Um, and I was thinking of an analogy, and I started thinking about dents. Dents in cars. Let me explain. <laughs> I can tell you're not virtual. <laughs> when you, uh, I've been to three NASCAR races. Y'all might be surprised to learn that. Uh, I never really even watched one on television. But when you live in Florence, 10 miles away from Darlington International Speedway, and someone invites you, you go to Darlington International Speedway, and you watch the race. So um, I went and learned all kinds of things and saw all kinds of things. Uh, yeah, I saw some people who looked like me, and, and a lot of people didn't look a bit like me. And I uh, saw some sights I'd rather not remember. Um, and so we finally got to our seats, and we got on... These headphones, which I found out were less about hearing what's going on, more about dampening the noise. Uh, and, and so I sat there, and at first I was impressed by the speed. Then I fell asleep. Because <laughs> you know, it's even as powerful as those things are, and as loud as it is, they're doing the same thing. And then it's hot, and you're going around, and the sound is even the same. It's just that constant roar. So I'm falling asleep, and then finally there's a wreck. So I'm awake again. Um, and I, I thought that was odd too. 500 laps of waiting for a wreck. Um, but what I thought about was how much money had gone into making that car perfect to start the race. Everything had been, had been in studios. They had figured out with computers exactly what the angle should be to make a perfectly aerodynamic car only to, within a few minutes, have it reshaped by life. Uh, either a, a mistake the driver made in hitting the side of the wall or a mistake another driver made in hitting the back and, and they're ripping things off and they're banging things out and, and that perfect car is now quite imperfect. So there's my dents now. I mean, that, that, that's life. I mean, that, that's what John's telling us. It is that sometimes 
we have caused some dents in this beautiful creation God has, has made in us. I mean, sometimes we have done some things, we, we've banged ourselves into some walls, we've made some mistakes that have caused some, some dents. And, and, and sometimes it's, we got to say it, our fault. Sometimes we have, have sinned. And, and that's that, that perfect car that was, that was made that was going to help us get to that race faster. I mean, the whole design of the thing is let who can be the first one to get there. Each dent then slows the car down. If, if, if it was faster to have dents, they would start out with dents. But when they, they started out with this perfectly smooth car because that was going to get them there faster. And along the way, here come the dents. But the other part of it is... And, and, and the part that, that John's baptism can't wash off is sometimes people bang into us. Sometimes the dents weren't our fault. Sometimes another driver made a mistake, and, and we ended up dealing with it. We're the ones who are bruised. We're the ones who, who take, take the brunt of it. So I was thinking of, of Jesus' baptism. You've got, got Jesus coming who doesn't have those dents he's caused will quickly have dents, bruises, brokenness, others have caused. And I, I start thinking about what it means to be both baptized in John's baptism, this baptism of repentance, but also, and I think Jesus is an and, and also his baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. I think part of it is that Jesus is renewing not just the dents we've caused, that's the repentance part. But also renewing us from the dense others. When Jesus comes out of the water, you, you hear this voice from heaven. Behold, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Now think about what Matthew's presented. Chapter 2, Jesus is a child. Passively taken to Egypt, to Nazareth. Turn the page, chapter 3. He's an adult coming to be baptized. We assume he's done something. We know he's lived so many years. But there is absolutely nothing in Matthew to show us that he has pleased his father. He's a child taken to Egypt. He's a child taken to Nazareth. He comes to the baptism, and the voice from heaven says, Behold, this is my Son, with whom I'm well pleased. He's done nothing to earn God's pleasure. It's bestowed upon him. This is my Son, with whom I'm well pleased. I was reading that to Mac the other day. Sometimes, I think it's part of problem being a preacher's kid. What are we going to hear about on Sunday? So, there we go. Matthew 3. So, so I start to uh, read it to him. He says, I didn't know that God spoke when Jesus was baptized. As if he memorized the scriptures, and that was like one new point. <laughs> um, I said, yeah, and, and I think that happens whenever anyone is baptized. I think God speaks these same kind of words. And of course he says, what did you hear when I was baptized? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't hear it. But I felt it. And I, I feel it whenever someone's baptized. Whenever a person is baptized, I, I feel God saying, this is my beloved child with whom I'm well pleased. And of course, if you go on the next step, um, what, would I, what did I have done when I was six months old to please God for him to say that? Or, or what adult had I done when I was 30 and I got baptized for God to say I had pleased him? Or 70 when I got baptized and God said, I'm well pleased with him. What had I done? I think that's the, that's the fire, that's the Holy Spirit part of Jesus' baptism. It is. The repentance part is the cleansing of the water. The, 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 the Holy Spirit and the fire come into us and say, these dents you've caused, you can be forgiven of. These dents others have caused, you can be forgiven of. Because your primary identity is not the dents on your body, the bruises in your soul. That's not who you are. You are broken. I am broken, but not ultimately. Our brokenness is like that fracture that some of you know way too much about. 
that does heal back. It, and it leaves a scar that they can perceive. A doctor, a trained doctor can feel your bone and figure out, oh, that's when you broke that. But that's not your identity. That, that, that's part of your history. It is part of what you've come to come through or are coming through, but that's not who you are. Who you are is a child of God. Beloved of God, with whom God is well pleased. That's who you are. Those other things are, are part of your story. But they aren't who you are. So I think when we come to this, to this water, this font, we come and say, I have some dents in me that I need smoothed out because I can't run the race as quickly for God if I still am living in these dents. I, I'm not getting us there as quickly as maybe God would have. But I have some other dents that I didn't cause. Some of these dents are what others have done to me. Even so, that's not who I am. Who I am is child of God. Beloved of God. And even though I didn't do anything to deserve it, God is well pleased with me. Because that's God's default position. There's a psalm we're, we're, we're thankful for. Psalm 103. In it, it, it kind of recovers both. It, the verse we usually quote is, as far as the east is from the west, east is from the west, so far God removes our transgressions from us. And we're glad of that, of course, because that, that's the sign that we can be forgiven of all this mess that, that we brought upon ourselves. But, but then it goes on to say, as a father loves his child with compassion, so God loves those who have the fear of the Lord. That's God's default position. Compassionate father, loving father, the kind of father who looks down and says, I am pleased with my child. When we come to these waters, we, we say, we reclaim, we reconnect with a God who says, I'm pleased. I'm pleased. You are my child, my beloved. I'm pleased. In a few moments, we're going to go through with a liturgy, and it's familiar words because you hear it when we baptize another. But today, hear it for yourself. We're, we're not rebaptizing you. Let's be clear. We don't do that. But we do reaffirm our baptism. We reclaim it. We, we claim it again. And so what we'll do is we'll go through this liturgy and we'll, we'll pray these prayers and we'll, we'll remember what it means that God can work through water to change lives, to renew lives. Behold, I'm making all things new. And we'll come and you're invited to, to touch the water, maybe make the sign of the cross on your forehead. Remember who you are, your primary identity, beloved child of God. Claim it. And ask God to take away those other identities that have taken hold in your life. Because, get back to that NASCAR analogy. The more we are consumed with our dents, the slower we are to getting to where the race is born. When we're consumed with getting to the end, then the victory comes quick. And we want to be part of, of God's victory. I invite you to turn your attention.